I'm going to read tonight before we sing our second hymn. I want to read from Psalm 91. Let us hear the word of God. Reading, of course, from the authorised version. Uh, Psalm 91 uh, was one of those psalms uh, that was sung uh, by um, the 36th Ulster Division as they left um, Helen's Tower in the Clandeboy Estate uh, to make their way uh, towards the uh, Psalm. Uh, so we're, we're going to just read it uh, together. Uh, Psalm uh, 91. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy sight, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation and in John chapter 15 verse 13 we read greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you henceforth I call you not servants for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. Amen. We know that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing these readings from the Holy Scriptures. Well, just before we have our act of remembrance, I want to just read a further passage of Scripture at this time from the book of Romans. I want to read from Romans chapter 5. <coughs> Familiar words, words that I have no doubt were read by <coughs> chaplains of the armed forces and before the battle of the Saul. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom 
we have now received the atonement. Amen. And the reading there at verse 11. Could I just ask that the congregation stands for a moment? Our brother uh, William Smith, who was a member of the Royal Navy, is going to come and on our behalf, he's going to pin the wreath on a board as a symbol of our remembrance uh, of those that have fallen, especially during this uh, centenary of the song. remain standing Robert Lawrence Binion's Ode of Remembrance. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Please be seated. Now let's turn in our Bibles just to one verse of Scripture. And that verse is taken from Job chapter 41. <laughs> and it's in the verse 8. Job chapter 41 verse 8. And before someone reminds me, I'll tell you, yes, two years ago in 19, uh, uh, or 2014, in the anniversary of the start of World War I, uh, I, I made reference to this uh, text. Job 41, verse 8. Lay thine hand upon me. Remember the battle. Do no more. Lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. 
Let's have prayer together. Heavenly Father, we ask thee tonight to accept of our thanks for thy presence with us, for the old hymns of Zion that we've sung. And we've sung them, O God, by way of praise unto thee, but we've sung them mindful of those especially who were heading to the psalm on the 1st of July, sung them. And, O God, we thank thee for these words of Scripture that we have read. And, Lord, we're conscious that soldiers who are preparing for battle also heard them read in their hearing. Lord, we want to thank thee even for the wreath that our brother William, uh, who served in the Royal Navy, has attached in the board. And, O God, we do so by way of remembering all of the fallen during the war, World War I, World War II, subsequent wars since, and even before that. And, O God, we thank thee especially for the sacrifice of the fallen uh, during the Battle of the Psalm. And in this centenary, Lord, in this hundredth anniversary year, we pray that thou will come strangely near. And we ask thee that thou will help us to do as thou hast said. Remember the battle. And, O oh God, we pray that we'll not only we remember, and, O oh God, we'll commemorate, but we'll be wiser because thou will come and teach us and help us to learn valuable lessons. Lord, help us to interpret all things in light of the Scripture, for thou hast a gold mine of truth and information for us. If we but see it and learn, give us grace. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Open our hearts. And what we pray for ourselves as a congregation, we pray for every congregation throughout this province of true born-again believers. We cry to thee, Lord, that thou remember thy people and that thou will visit us with much grace. And Lord, you'll help our countrymen and women to remember the battle. And we pray, Lord, as they think about soldiers volunteering to go, laying down their life, that they'll be forced by thy spirit to think about the greatest soldier of all who volunteered to come from heaven's glory to earth, went all the way to the cross, entered into the conflict, the battle of the ages, and defeated sin and Satan and death on the tree. And we thank thee that he is victory for us, and all who trust him can enter into that victory. Lord, give us grace, give us understanding, and help us at this time. We just leave ourselves now with thee. Come and bless us and be with us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now my text tonight, as I've already announced, is taken from Job 41, verse 8. Three words, remember the battle. So the children can know the text now. Uh, here's the theme. Remember the battle. I'm aware I'm taking it out of its context. I, I, I'm going to apply it tonight to the battle of the saw. Someone has once said that the tragedy of war is that it uses man's best to do man's worst. How true that is. World War I was known as the Great War. It was called by some as the war to end all wars. World War I, of course, was a global conflict that took place mostly in Europe between the years of 1914 and 1918. So you young people now know when World War I was, 1914 to 1918. It was a terrible war. It left millions dead. It left millions wounded. A war which, of course, led to World War II 31 years later. Now, there are, of course, many decisive, important battles during World War I. And one, I believe, stands out among the rest, and that is the Battle of the Somme. The Battle of the Somme commenced on the first day of July, 1916. So on the first of July, 2016, it'll be a hundred years of that battle. And that's why we're having a centenary service. The battle commenced, as I've said, on the first of July, 1916, and continued until the 18th of November, 1916. So it spanned out over several months. And it was one of the worst Loss of life encountered in any military campaign in British war history. Some 430,000 British soldiers, 200,000 French soldiers, 500,000 German soldiers 
were killed or wounded. The, the psalm, of course, was destined to go down in the annals of history as one of the bloodiest battles ever fought. And I want us tonight, very simply, for the next 20 minutes, I want you to lend me your ears. I want you young children to, to lend me your ears. And I want you to think about three things. As you think about the words, remember the battle. You, you know now the theme. There's the text. I want you to think of three things. One, the subject of the battle. Remember, it means recall to one's mind. And we could ask ourselves, why? I, I want to answer that. Surely it's important that we commemorate the battle of the psalm. It's important that we remember the fallen. And we could argue, well, it is the centenary. And we couldn't let this day go past in history without remembering the battle. We're, we're thinking of the 1st of July, 100 years ago. The psalm, of course, for many, is a very ghastly word. A horrific word. And the minute the psalm is mentioned, people think of the fallen. Their bravery. Their heroism. Their sacrifice. I have to think of the war ceremony in Kohima, in India. There's a memorial there to 1,420 Allied war dead of the 2nd British Battalion. And etched on that memorial is an epitaph. It's called the Kohima Epitaph. And this is what it says. Now I want you to listen. When you go home, tell them of us. And say, for your tomorrow, we give our today. You see, today we enjoy freedom. We have got free civil and religious liberty. We have the right to an open Bible, the right to free assembly. We have got a parliamentary democracy. Thank the Lord we're not in a totalitarian state. Thank the Lord we're not under the jackboot of Nazism. We've got a free press. We have got human rights for all. We've got the rule of law. Isn't it true that in the British parliamentary democracy system that all are equal under the law? And nobody is above the law, not even the queen uh, of the land. Why? How? It ties into battles like the psalm. This was a battle where Protestant soldiers... And Roman Catholic soldiers from the Falls Road, volunteers of the Connaught Rangers, fought and died side by side. There was other Roman Catholic areas where Roman Catholics volunteered to also come and fight at the Somme. And what I'm saying is, we dare not forget their bravery. We dare not forget their sacrifice. We, we must never forget. Not only because it's the centenary, but we must never forget because of their courage. I think of the great sacrifice of the men uh, from the 36th Ulster Division. You see, the 36th Ulster Division was a, an infantry division of the British Army. It was part of Lord Kissinger's new army. It was formed in September 1914. It was originally called the Ulster Division and it was made up of members of the Ulster Volunteer Force who formed 13 additional battalions for three existing regiments, the Royal Irish Fusiliers, the Royal Irish Rifles, and the Royal Enniskillen Fusiliers. And on the 1st of July, 1916, when the bugle sounded, 7.30 a.m. in the morning, the 36th Ulster Division advanced out of their trenches, these men went over the top. They cried, no surrender. They rushed the German lines. And at the end of the day, the first day, they had reached their objective. In fact, the only part of the British army to reach their objective that day. And it came at a dreadful cost. Do you know on that first day, there was 2,069 Ulster men from the 36th Ulster Division were dead. 
They gave their lives in sacrifice and freedom. On the second day, some 5,500 officers and enlisted men were dead, missing or wounded. And a war correspondent of the time, Philip Gibbs, said, and I quote, It was the finest display of human courage in the whole of the world that he had ever seen. Do you know when men left Northern Ireland, the last sight that they had was Helen's Tower, the Clandy Boy Estate. That's where they trained from 1914. You can think of them leaving their home, saying goodbye to mummy, sister, saying goodbye to dad, leaving their friends, their jobs, their livelihood, and they're going off to fight. The last sight they have is of Helen's Tower. In Thiefel in France to this day there stands the Ulster Memorial Tower. It was unveiled by Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson. Lord Carson was ill. And it was unveiled in indebtedness to the contribution of the 36th Ulster Division. And it's an exact replica of Helen's Tower in Clandyboy Estate. Now, oh, this is relevant to us. This is not just dry history. You, you think of it tonight. Our fellow countrymen from this wee province, from, from wee Northern Ireland, 5,500 officers, enlisted men, died, missing or wounded at the Somme. I'm passionate about it because one of them was my granduncle, a man by the name of Thomas McFall from Bushmills. Why remember the song? Here's the subject of the battle. Because it's the centenary. It's the right thing to do. We remember it because of their courage and sacrifice. That they're bravery. And we also remember it because it's commanded by God in the Bible. Remember the battle. We call it to mind. You see, the battle has important lessons for us. God would want us to learn about the horrors of war. And I want to tell you, war is a dreadful thing. War should never be entered into lightly or half-heartedly. War is a terrible scourge of any country or society. War brings home not only its horrors, but the, the certainty of death. Because when people go to fight, they'll die. It brings home the brevity of life. Young men in their flower cut down. Their life is gone. It values the preciousness of life. We, we heard this morning on the snippet on the radio of a woman who had four sons from Belfast who went off to fight at the Somme. And she got news that all four were dead. A mother losing four sons. Then it turned out one of them was just wounded and eventually came home. But he had lost his three brothers. You see, in the 1st of July, there was a total of 19,240 British war dead. In one day. It was the most bloodiest day in the British military history. Did you know there was only 8,000 dead at Waterloo? There was only 4,000 died in the D-Day landings at Normandy. And out of that 19,240 British war dead, 500, or sorry, 5,500 were Ulster men. There was hardly a home in this province not affected. Every town, every village was affected. In Belfast, there was 18, 000, or 1,800 volunteers dead. In Newtonards and Bangor, there was 1,500. In Ballyclare, there was 30. In Bush Mills, I don't actually know the number, but I know that Thomas McFall was, was among them. I know that Robert Quigg was another. 1916, the 12th of July, was cancelled. There was five minutes of silence throughout the province. The whole country was in shock. You see, it's good to remember. It's the centenary after all. We remember their courage and their sacrifice. We remember this command because there's lessons for us. Think of this Kohima epitaph. When you go home, Tell them of us and say for your tomorrow, we give our today. 
I want you to think secondly, the soldiers of the battle. Yeah, let's focus for a moment on the makeup of the 36th Ulster Division. 13 battalions brought into three regiments. The Royal Irish Fusiliers, the Royal Irish Rifles, the Royal Irish Fusiliers. All volunteers. Not forced, not bribed, not coerced, not conscripted against their will. They volunteered as free men. They died as free men. They were the men, of course, of the early Ulster Volunteer Force. They engaged the enemy voluntarily. They went over the top. As I've told you, they cried, no surrender. They, they, they rushed the German machine guns. Many of them, of course, were, were cut down as they run forward. but men who gave themselves for the cause of freedom, the cause of truth and righteousness. As I've told you, 2,069 died in that first day. 5,500 on day two. That was the total. They gave their lives voluntarily. They gave them sacrificially. I want you to think of this. A sacrifice by a volunteer. A, a voluntary sacrifice of themselves. We remember the 36th Ulster Division. We also remember the 10th Irish Division. And the 16th Irish Division. Protestant. Roman Catholic from the Falls Road and other parts of Belfast. Side by side. All facing the enemy as volunteers. And I have to tell you, to me, these would be the most gallant and the bravest soldiers that ever lived. And when I think of the soldiers of the battle, volunteering for sacrifice, even the sacrifice of themselves, I see a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest volunteer soldier who ever lived didn't he volunteer to come into the world didn't he volunteer to take human nature to take a human body didn't he volunteer to come and live a sinless life volunteer to come and die doesn't the bible say in philippians 2 and 7 that he was obedient unto death volunteer to fight in a battle the battle of ages a, a battle not against a physical enemy. A battle not against Germans or any other nationality, but a battle against sin and against Satan. Remember, the Lord Jesus was a sinless man. He never sinned in thought and word and deed. He came into this world so he could enter the battlefield at Mount Calvary. And I just want to point out, he came as a volunteer. How do I know that? Well, see, the Bible tells us in John chapter 17 and in the um, verse 18, it, it, it says, John 17, sorry, it's John 10, verse 17. He says, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Yes, he was chosen by the father from all eternity to be the, the eternal son who would come into the world to be the saviour of the world. Yes, he was sent by the father in a mission of mercy. But he was also a volunteer. He didn't have to come. He could have stayed in heaven. That was his right. He could have said to his father, well, they're sinners. Let them get what they deserve. The wages of sin is death. They deserve the fire of hell for all eternity. They're a bunch of sinners, a bunch of rebels. Let them go, father. Yes, he was chosen. Yes, he was sent. But he was also a volunteer. He volunteered to come into the world 
to lay down his life for sinners, to overcome death by his own death in the tree. He, he, he fought sin and Satan. He, he fulfilled the law of God perfectly. He offered himself a once and for all sacrifice for sin. On the tree, he destroyed him that had the very power of death. Doesn't the Bible tell us there in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, tremendous encouragement for us, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, that's his own death on the cross, that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. To, to, to bondage. But when you think of the battles of the world, when you think of all the soldiers that have died in conflict, all their sacrifice, the, 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 their blood shedding, you see, it all points us to Christ. And I ask tonight, do you know him? Do you love him? Are you trusting in him? Is he your Lord and Saviour? You see, these were truths that were pressed home to those soldiers that were heading to the psalm. Why did he come? He loved us. Yes, we had no interest in him. Yes, we had no fear nor thought nor regard for him. But even though we had no interest in him, no thought, fear nor regard of him, he loved us enough to come and lay down his life for us on the tree. Greater love of no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. For when we were yet sinners, the Bible tells us, Christ died for us. Why do we go to church on the Lord's Day? Is it not because of gratitude for what he has done for us? Is it not out of a thankful and glad heart that, that he laid us down his life for us? Surely it's right that we're here. It just is right that we remember battles of history and think of the courage and the sacrifice of those that have died. Surely it points us to the greatest soldier of all, the battle of the ages. He loved us to do that. He volunteered to do it, and therefore we love him. We, we say to individuals tonight, not only in the church, but in the community, in the country, don't trust in the church. Certainly don't trust in the loyal orders. The orange order will not save you, even though it's a grand institution, neither will the royal black preceptory. Your lifestyle, good clean living will not save you. The leaders of the church will not save you. Only Christ. Isn't it written of him in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Those that died in the psalm, were looked upon as a lost generation. You think of young men, 19, 20, some a bit younger, some a bit older. 5,500 from this province, and they don't come home to mommy or daddy. They're a lost generation. They're lost to their families. They're a lost to their country. They gave themselves as volunteers in sacrifice. But when I think of a lost generation, I have to think of those tonight who are part of Adam's race, lost in sin without God, without Christ and without hope. And what they need, of course, is to be pointed to him who's the greatest soldier of all, to his voluntary sacrifice, for, for, to, to, to think of what he has done out of love, and then trust him as Lord and Saviour. I want you to think of two other things, and we're finished. I want you to think of the symbols of the battle. What was the motif of the 36th Ulster Division? Think of what is called the Ulster flag, young people. It's the red hand of Ulster. That was the motif of the 36th Ulster Division. And you have to think tonight, of course, of the, the sacrifice of red hands. 420,000 British dead alone. 5,500 men from the 36th Ulster Division. You see, it all points us again to Christ. In, in Psalm 22, it, it, it talks about uh, the piercing of his hands and his feet. And over there in John chapter 20, if you look at verses 19 and 20, just for a moment, John 19 
Uh, John 20 verses 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, notice this, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Let's just get the picture. Here's the disciples. And they're in this room with locked doors for fear of the Jews. These disciples are crushed. They're defeated. They're fearful. The Lord Jesus comes and stands in their midst. He's a message for them. Peace be unto you. And in that terrified state, what does he do? He showed unto them his hands and his side. Why his hands? Why his side? His nail-pierced hands. His pierced side. Why? Maybe this Sunday evening you're in the house of God and you're fearful and you're afraid of the future and you're in a state of anguish because of your circumstances, your situation. Maybe in your personal life you have some sort of crisis. Maybe it's a family crisis. Maybe you're worried about the future. Maybe you're even worried about finance. Maybe you're worried even about the uh, financial situation facing the church. Maybe you're worried about the finishing of the building next door. Uh, uh, And... uh, I would say to you tonight, in all your fear, whatever your worry, whatever your difficulty is, look at the nail-pierced hands of Jesus. You see, the red hand of Ulster is a symbol because it points us not only to sacrifice, but it points us to the Savior. Look at those hands. What do we read in verse 20 of John 20? Then were the disciples glad. When they saw the Lord, they saw the marks of his sacrifice. They knew it was the same Jesus who'd been crucified that was resurrected again. They they knew it was a real resurrection body. You see, the red hand points us to the real red hands of Christ. Again, I asked the question, are you trusting in Christ? A Roman Catholic priest was visiting in the hospital on one occasion. He was going around various people and he was wanting to pray with them. He was wanting to talk to them about the forgiveness of sins. And he came over to this man and he started to talk to him. And he said he would like to pray with him. And the man says to him, now the man of course wasn't a Roman Catholic, but the priest didn't know that. He was a true believer. You know what he said? Show me your hands. So the priest did as he was bidden. And then the man said, sir, I'm sorry, but you're not my priest. You can't forgive my sins. Because my priest has nail prints in his hands. You see, we can go directly to Christ. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. The man with the red hands. Not only think of the the, uh, uh, motif in the symbolism. But but think of the memorial to the 36th Ulster Division. I've already made reference to the Ulster Tar and Thiefel. It's a memorial to the fallen. You can visit that tower. I have never been to Thiefel in France. I would love to have went this year, but I I will go at some time. I'm told it's a very moving, memorable experience. What do you think of the memorial? What is it? It's the Ulster Tower in Thiefel. And it was to commemorate the fallen at the Somme, the 36th Ulster Division. And then let's think of words like Psalm 18 verse 2. The Lord is my high tower. The psalmist was telling us that the Lord has eight things to him. And the last thing he mentions is he's my high tower. Eighth in biblical numerics according to the late Dr. Paisley. Always speaks of a new beginning. It's Proverbs 17 and 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. You see the tower is a symbol of strength. It's a place of security and safety. It's a place where there's satisfaction and rest. And you see, every person that's redeemed tonight who's trusting in those uh, man with the, the red pierced hands has the Lord as his tower, his high tower. And he's safe forever from the ravages of the enemy. He's safe forever from the fiery darts of the enemy. 
the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it. There's the people, the righteous, those that are saved. What do they do when the enemy comes with his accusations, with his fiery darts, when the enemy comes to attack him? And the devil, of course, is the accuser of the brethren. The righteous runneth in to this tower. I would say to you tonight, think of this memorial. And ask yourself, in my mind, have I got a memorial? To salvation, because the name of the Lord is a strong and high tower for me. You know, on that first day of the Battle of the Psalm, before the battle commenced, there was five days of artillery bombardment on the German lines. 1.7 million shells were dropped. Mines were donated. It was believed that the German front lines had been destroyed. The tragedy was that despite the arterial artillery bombardment, despite the mine detonations going off, it didn't work. The Germans were still there. The men that come over the top shouting no surrender were full of confidence that the Germans' lines had been destroyed. What a rude awakening in that first day. Men got over the top with full confidence, and yet it was false with a false hope that the German enemy had been destroyed. We could really say they were victims of wrong information. And how many are prepared to go out into God's eternity, the victims of wrong information? Who or what are you trusting in? Think of these symbols. The red hand motif. The memorial. Are you trusting in the Lord? Do you know the red hand in reality? Do you know that the Lord is a high and strong tower for his people? And no matter what the enemy does, that is a safe place, the only place, the secure place for the true child of God. Don't be a victim of wrong information. I trust and pray this evening that you will remember the battle, especially the song. You young people will want to learn more. You can listen again to the sermon if you want to uh, on the internet. It'll be there and we would encourage you to do that. Let's learn from our history and let's decide to be soldiers of the cross no matter what happens now or in the future. May the Lord take these few words and bless them to 